Well, let's start with thinking about economic growth. I tend to think about economic growth as a race. So you can think about a race. Here are a lot of men racing. When we look at how countries grow, they tend to separate themselves into packs, the same as you would have in a road race or a bicycle race. And the reason is the following. If you think about a road race, I don't know if any of you have ever run a race like a marathon or a 5K race, something like that, but you have packs that kind of naturally determine themselves based on runners who are essentially going at different speeds. So in one pack, you're aiming for a finish at one sort of time, and in another pack, it might be a faster time or a slower time. If you're leading the pack, it's quite difficult to jump into the next pack. You have to break away, run by yourself, and try and catch up with the next pack. That's quite tough. You have to face the wind all by yourself. But if you're inside a pack and you're near the back of the pack, it's much easier to move up in the pack because you can get behind people, you can draft on them, they face the wind for you, you save up your energy and you push towards the front of the pack. Economic growth is quite similar. The packs are determined by deep factors in our economies that have to do with our geography, our culture, things that are very difficult to change but which have a big effect on our living standards. So if you're in a pack that has sort of similar deep factors like this, your legal institutions, your, your, your temperatures, your access to water, things like that, then if you're at the back of that pack, you can actually move up fairly quickly. And I'll talk about some of the ways that you can do that. But we tend to see the poorer countries in each pack growing more quickly than the wealthier countries. They catch up. That's something that we see over time. But it's quite difficult to jump into a new pack because then you have to change some of those deep factors. You have to change those bedrock institutions of the economy. So it's actually quite similar to the dynamics of a race. And because I'm an economist, I also like to think about it with a graph. So you can sort of think roughly as time on the x-axis and living standards on the y-axis, though I won't go into any units yet. And those deep factors that I spoke about are sort of setting the limits for living standards that I'm going to reach over time. Earlier in time, I'm going to grow faster, and then as time goes on, I'm going to sort of hit an asymptote. I'm going to flatten out a little bit as I reach those living standards. And this happens in virtually every country. Growth slows down until you make a big change that allows you to jump to a higher curve. So you're actually aiming for a higher target. You're going into a faster pack. Now, these are the limits of growth, but of course, there are things that can slow you down or speed you up along the way. So you have some obstacles. You might have a catastrophic natural disaster, or you might have a war, something like that. It doesn't actually change those bedrock institutions of the economy necessarily, but it will slow you down. Uh, but there are also things that are opportunities, like opening new markets through things like trade agreements. That can help you to speed up. It doesn't change the bedrock institutions either, but it makes it easier for you to accumulate capital and increase living standards. And then, of course, there are some things that you have to watch out for that could imperil the whole system, global risks, risks to the financial system, et cetera. But this is a good sort of way of using an economic model that's easy to get a handle on that reflects that pack mentality. You want to move up as fast as you can within your pack, but if you can, you want to jump onto a higher curve, get into a faster pack, so that you're actually aiming at a higher target for living standards. Well, in practice, this model reflects itself in a sort of narrative of development that we see in many countries. And we're going to start from the very basic stage when you're essentially on a subsistence farm and see how you move all the way to being an advanced economy. Well, the idea here, as I said, is to climb up the curve, but also push up the curve. First step in many economies is to move from farms to cities. Get people off the farms, move them into cities. Well, why do you want to do that? Because the way to make people more productive is to put their labor next to capital. And the best place to do that is in a city. You can get a lot of capital together, you can get a lot of labor together. Then you're going to be able to capture some economies of scale, make your production more efficient, make you competitive as an exporter. You're also going to want to build infrastructure for expansion so that you can be an exporter through ports, through land, transportation, and also that infrastructure helps you to move people from the farms into the cities. As you do this, you also want to be adopting technology. There's a heck of a lot of technology out there in the world which you can adopt. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
And if you look at the growth stories of places like Japan and then Korea and then China and now Vietnam, a lot of this is adoption of technology. First, you are bringing people from the farm into the cities, getting them into big factories and service operations where you can capture those economies of scale, and then you're adopting technology that already exists, but you're able to <coughs> export at a lower price because you have this uh, enormous supply of labor that's getting pro productive for the first time. Now, after you've gotten people into the cities and you've adopted the technology and you're starting to export, you're starting to produce more efficiently, what's wonderful about the fact that you've concentrated all that labor is that it's also easier to reach them and their children with public services. So the next generation will have better health care, better education, better hygiene, etc. Right. This, we saw this in the United States. If we look at the United States at the turn of the 20th century, there was a huge migration into cities. There were enormous factories, not always the cleanest or safest factories, but there were enormous factories, and conditions were quite poor, but they gradually started to improve. As wages rose, people demanded slightly better public services as well, and their children got better public services. And the municipal areas started to get better hospitals and universities and schools. So the next generation was even better equipped to grow. Highlighting a few of the dots which are above the curve, these are the countries which have higher living standards than you would expect given the level of urbanization. And they're quite a variety and, and you could pick more points along this curve, but here are four, Sri Lanka, Egypt, Thailand, and Kazakhstan. Some of these countries are particularly interesting to me because they face the same challenge of diversifying their economies. And, and Sri Lanka is especially interesting because it has a low urbanization and yet they've still managed to raise living standards substantially, also after a lengthy civil conflict. So these are some of the countries that we might be able to learn something from as well. Well, why are other countries doing better than Nigeria? We saw there were quite a few that were above that curve. Nigeria's right on trend, but some of the others are above it, so why? Well, I've done some research in the last couple of years that tries to break down the differences in living standards between countries to try and understand how those deep factors in the economy lead to different standards of living in the long term. And when I do that, first, I want to look at those structural elements that have historical roots or natural roots or cultural roots. This is something that economists do because we want to be able to separate the chicken and the egg, right? There, there are some factors that are going to increase your economic growth, but you would then think that economic growth also increased those factors, such as, for example, the rule of law. You would say, well, okay, if I have rule of law, it's going to be easier for my economy to grow, but if people are wealthy, then they might say, well, we really want to have rule of law. But you don't have this chicken and egg problem when you look at things like whether a country is landlocked. Because no matter how far, fast you grow, it doesn't change whether you're landlocked. <laughs> you might be able to buy some port access somewhere, but it's not exactly the same. So we look at these structural elements that have very deep roots. Again, I'm going to be looking at that same measure of living standards. And what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to take out resource rents. So I'm looking at the portion of living standards which does not come from natural resources because I want to find out how well countries are doing things which have to do with policies, decisions that they've made, not just whether they were lucky enough to be sitting on a big oil patch. Now, if we look at these factors and how much they explain the variation in living standards between countries, the biggest thing is geography. Just your distance from the equator and whether or not you're landlocked explains 50% of the variation in living standards across countries. Imagine that. Half of your living standards have to do with where you were born geographically. Forget about every other factor, just geography. Another 5% comes from the type of legal foundations that you have. And a lot of that comes from who colonized you and what legal system did they install. And, and Nigeria was in some ways lucky to have the British legal system which seems to be superior to the German or the French civil law or even the Scandinavian systems as far as what colonial powers have left as their legacies. But it's not a guarantee of growth as I'll talk about later. Finally, I looked at gender equality, which is potentially a proxy for deep-seated cultural factors, and that actually came out to be quite important as well. 25% of living standards explained by gender equality. It makes sense, right? Because if women are participating in the labor force, they're generating more income 
likely than if they were at home. Obviously, work at home has value as well, but they tend to be more productive when they have access to more capital and technology. That happens in the labor force. Women are working. Living standards are going up. Now, that leaves another 20%, which you can credit to innovation and entrepreneurship and everything else. And if you look at this uh, economic model and you say, well, who are the big outliers? Who's doing well with that 20%? Countries like the United States do quite well because they've been able to create an economic climate that allows them to grow a little more quickly than you might expect given these other factors. All right, so this is breaking down the deep factors and we're gonna talk about how we might mitigate some of the effects of these factors later. Well, let's talk about geography first. Obviously being in the tropics is difficult and it poses a challenge. Uh, Health is something that economists often emphasize and it has come through in academic study after academic study as almost a prerequisite for economic development. And if you're in the tropics, you face much bigger health challenges than if you're in temperate zones. And so it would be a bigger priority for Nigeria to deal with health than it would be for, say, Kazakhstan. Universal health coverage is a way that many countries have chosen to deal with this. Uh, coverage with insurance and coverage with basic services, insurance to prevent health care episodes from becoming disastrous financial episodes, and services to ensure that people are healthy and, and have a longer life expectancy, a longer product, productive careers in the workforce. Well, in Nigeria, the last estimates I found were for a couple of years ago, the health coverage is estimated about 3 to 7% of the population. And you might say, well, Nigeria is a developing country and, and it's not surprising that it's low, but uh, if you look at coverage by basic services, in Sri Lanka, Kazakhstan, Thailand, you have 100% coverage of the population, essentially. And in Egypt, you're also committed to providing something close to that with basic services. And if you look at the coverage with insurance, it's about half of the population in Ghana and about three quarters in Rwanda, going back about five years to the most recent estimates. So this location and this level of economic development is not an obstacle to creating that kind of health coverage, which leads to a healthier workforce today and in the next generation as well. 